Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? All right, good, good, good. Don't start the clock till I tell you to, all right? All right, um, I want you to repeat a couple words after me. I want to get everybody excited. Juice is flowing. Um, vulnerability. vulnerability. Failure. Failure. Determination. Determination. Success. Success. I don't know why. I just wanted to hear you all say some things. <laughs> no, we'll get to that in a little bit. But I wanted to tell you all a little bit about my story, because that's what this book is about. Um, Notes from a Young Black Chef, it came together um, very similar to tonight. Um, I did a lot of speeches in the inner city talking to kids. Um, I'm from the Bronx, New York. And OK, got to be from the Bronx here. Good solid three of them, that's good. <laughs> but um, there was a literary agent in the crowd, and I told my story. And she said, you should write this down. So I did just that. And I wrote a proposal, and we shopped it around. And luckily enough, Knopf, Penguin Random House, picked it up and turn that into a book um, that's being turned into a movie, which is really, really exciting. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, hey, what's up? I see you over there. Um, so I'll start with the story of my life, because that's what got me here today. So I grew up in the Bronx, New York, um, with a single mother. Um, it was me, her, and my sister. And she was an accountant. And she had babysitters raising us, because it's really hard to like, raise your kids in New York City and provide. So she thought of, like, how am I going like, to spend time with them um, and take care of them at the same time? So my family comes from a long line of restaurateurs. You know, back in the 40s and 50s, um, African Americans, even if it's set on paper that they can eat in restaurants in the South, couldn't go to these restaurants without being harassed. And it wasn't just restaurants, it was convenience stores, bars, and things like that. So um, the small communities always had juke joints you know, in the back of people's houses, you know, convenience stores, bars, restaurants. And my family was a family that always had restaurants. We always entertained. So when my mom was thinking about what could she do, she thought to when she was a little girl running around her mother's restaurant in Beaumont, Texas. So she started a catering company. And very much against the law, I became her first employee, all right? <laughs> I was five years old. Um, she put a little stool next to her. And I used to peel shrimp, cut vegetables, I just do whatever it took. You know, I, I really enjoyed being next to my mom because my parallel life with my father across the Bronx um, was very different. And as a kid, you kind of just absorb what's around you. You know, you don't know what's wrong. You just know that it is life. And in my father's house, um, you know, if I dropped a cup on the floor, um, it wasn't just like a stern talking to. I had to go and tally on a chart. Um, uh, it was called an ass whooping chart. It's kind of funny, but it's fucked up at the same time. <laughs> but um, that ass whooping chart would, wouldn't be doled out right then and there. It may happen a week later when we're just like hanging out and whenever the, he was angry and he would take his anger out on me that way. But then when I went to my mother's house, I had this loving environment, right? So I didn't know that I was being abused. I thought it was just normal. So when I got to school, I was acting out. And the guidance counselors didn't really know how to um, get through to me. And my mother didn't know how to get through to me. And I was started to get into gangs. I started to do drugs at a very young age, like nine years old. Um, and I was veering off on the wrong path, which is really, really easy to do in New York City in the Bronx. So my mother told me I was going on a two-week vacation to visit my grandfather in Nigeria. Now, when I got there, I, I learned two things. That this was not a vacation at all. My mother's a liar, OK? <laughs> so two years later, I returned back to America. Um, and I came back a changed man, you know, um, for many different reasons, you know. I learned to appreciate the small things that I have here in America, the things that we take for granted like conditioned air when you walk into a room. You know what I mean? Like things we don't think of. You know, electricity, you flick a switch, comes on. If it's not, you're cursing out your light bulb. Like, what the fuck is going on here, you know? Things that we take for granted every single day, a lot of people don't have these opportunities. So we have a leg up when we walk out of our door. So when I came back to America, I had a newfound appreciation for life. I went through school, went to college, and um, I kind of started falling back into the same things that got me sent out there in the first place, being an American teenager. And um, I remember being in college, 
and I was there for business administration. And I didn't, I went to school with $20 in my pocket. My mother didn't have enough to send me to school with money, with a like meal plan or anything like that. So I did what I knew how to do, which people were doing around me in the Bronx. I started selling drugs and started selling like alcoholic cocktail mixers, anything that I can get my hands on, I was selling to pay for school. Um, but I fell into this rabbit hole of just making a, like a, a lot of money, like $3,000 a week when I was like 17 years old. And I remember waking up one day from like a three day long party and there were like people like scattered across my house. I had a house that I rented off campus and I didn't even know anybody. And I saw Barack Obama walk across the stage and become the first black president. And I, you know, I've always done a lot of research and my parents have always told me where I come from and you know, living in Africa, I knew my ancestry. And I was like, man, like 35 years ago, at that time, I was like, there was a lot of restaurants that weren't even integrated. And here there is this black man that has become president of the United States. He's holding the highest office. And I'm sitting here kind of throwing my life away. I'm good at what I'm doing right now, but I could be good at something else. So I remember flushing everything down the toilet, giving out whatever I had left, besides the weed, I smoked all the weed. Um, <laughs> and then um, I bought a one, one way plane ticket to Louisiana where my mother moved to after I graduated um, high school. And I did the only thing I really knew how to do, which was work in restaurants. The only jobs that I've had were in restaurants, whether it was McDonald's or Rib Shack or, or things like that. So I started working in restaurants, you know, and I remember um, making $20 a day, um, going from making $3,000 a week in Baton Rouge, Louisiana as a waiter at a Rib Shack. And I remember just putting my head down, you know, knowing what that life was and not knowing any success stories from back home. Um, I also didn't have any role models in the culinary industry that looked like me, that were representation, but I knew that if I put my head down, I could achieve something. So um, the Gulf of Mexico had a huge oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And they were paying like ridiculous amounts of money for these guys to go out there and cook for these pirates cleaning up this oil. And it was like, I remember I got the call, it was like $1,900 a week. And I was like, shit, I'm back, baby. <laughs> I am back, here's my chance. If I go out there, I get fired in a week, I win in this situation, okay? <laughs> so I went out there and I remember I got on the boat and the first thing that the, the chef asked me was, do you know how to read? And I was like, excuse me? And he was like, yeah, do you know how to read? I have a lot of you that come on this boat that can't read a recipe. And I was like, well, I think you can tell by the way I'm talking to you, I know how to read, but also this conversation is over. Dude, you cook your food, I cook my food, and that's just how this is gonna go. I have three weeks on this boat till the helicopter comes back, and that's how this is gonna work, all right? Cool? Cool. So I cooked my food, he cooked his food. Luckily for me, all these guys are from backwoods, Louisiana. My family is Creole, so that's the only food I grew up cooking next to my mom since I was younger. So when he took his vacation off, his one week off, they were like, hey Kwame, do you mind being the head chef of the boat? Because your food is like way better than his food. <laughs> so I was like, hell yeah, I'll be the head chef of the boat. Now, it wasn't like this large cruise ship. It was like 30 people I was cooking for. But still, it was the first time that I was in charge of meal planning, of you know, procuring ingredients and things like that. So um, after they cleaned up all the oil, I moved back to New York City and I started working in more affluent restaurants. Started working at Kraft in New York you know, um, for bigger catering companies. But I missed like cooking my own food. I got bit by the bug. And if anyone, there's always a cook in the room, someone that knows how to cook, right? And the reason why you like cooking is because someone tells you like, yo, this food is really, this is good. <laughs> you know, they, you have that instant gratification when you pass that plate over. If you're like that person on Thanksgiving that always makes this one dish, it feels good. So once you do that every single day, you get bit by that bug. So I wanted to do that. I didn't know how I was gonna do it. So I was like, man, maybe I could start a catering company. But how am I gonna do that? I don't have any capital. You know, how am I gonna get uniforms or, or anything like that? So I was on the train coming home from work and a kid came in and he was selling candy for like a basketball team or something. They do that in New York City. And I was like, this is weird for a child to be out at 11.30 selling candy for a basketball team. <laughs> but then I was like, wait, forget all that. 
this kid just made $4 in one minute. I was like, how much is that an hour? I was like, what does an eight hour shift look like of this? So I did the math and this kid was making way more money than I was making tax free. So I went in the next day, I thanked them so much for the opportunity. I went to Costco, I bought a shit ton of candy and I got on the train and started selling candy for a catering company. And I swallowed my pride and I had a vision. I wanted to start my own business and I wanted to cook my own food and do something that made me happy in whatever light that was. And I had no idea that would get me to a stage where I'm at right now, where I'm talking to you all about my life story and I have a, a book being turned into a movie, being played by the guy from Get Out. Like, it's weird <laughs> to really think about that. Thank you, thank you. But, you know, most importantly, it, it's about determination, you know? It's about vulnerability, what I talked about earlier, right? About your successes, your failures. And that's what life is about, you know? That's what kids really need to hear, that it's not this linear path, you know? It's not an overnight path. It's really about putting your head down and pushing through those tough moments. Now, I can go on and talk about my whole story, but I do want you to get the book, so I'm not gonna say everything. <laughs> but, you know, I, I opened a res I went on to work in some of the best restaurants in the world. Um, I opened a restaurant here in DC. Um, I got a $2 million investment to open up my dream restaurant, and it lasted 11 weeks. Um, and I was the laughing stock of the industry here. But I remember where I came from, and I remember the, my ancestors, and I remember we were opening restaurants before it was cool to open restaurants. You know, my, people in my family were opening restaurants out of necessity. So it would be a, um, a shame not to continue and push through. So six months later, I opened up Kith and Kin, um, it was rated best restaurant in America last year by Food and Wine Magazine, Esquire, um, Michelin Guide. So um, with that being said, I just want to leave you on a note that whether you go with this book or not, um, the story of like determination and following your dreams and working to be somebody is one of the best gifts you can give someone that's young. So thank you. <laughs>